Uh, thank you for joining me with uh, my talk. The title, as uh, Peter has just said, is AUV localization with size scan sonars. But to start with, uh, sorry to break it for you, this isn't exact, the exact pipeline of size scan sonar for AUV localization isn't exactly what I'll be talking about because um, that's kind of um, the topic of my PhD thesis. And I've just started. Um, I started 2020 in October, so uh, relatively new. Instead, what I'll be talking about is the bits and pieces um, that I have done with SciScan Sonar. So the outline of today's talk will be like this. We'll start with a bit of introduction to SciScan Sonar, and then I'll talk about an application where um, that is titled Local Feature Correspondence Using SciScan Sonar Images, which was actually my master's thesis. And then finally, I'll conclude this talk with a uh, application briefly touching on how size scan sonar data will be used at the Christina Bay demo. So um, let's start with the introduction to size scan sonar. Um, so sonar stands for sound navigation and ranging. As the name suggests, it means that uh, we are using the transmission and reflection of acoustic waves to map the underwater environment. So on this image to the right, you are seeing three types of sonars, the size scan sonar, uh, single beam and multi beam sonar, uh, along with their swath, which is the horizontal segment on the seafloor that they are capable of covering. Um, if we look at side scan sonar specifically, we can see that it is transmitting one beam from each side of the vessel. And comparing to the other type, the other two types of sonars, the pros of side scan sonar is that it gives you high resolution photorealistic images. Another thing is that, um, as you probably can see from the swath, um, it gives much larger coverage to the seafloor compared to single beam or multi beam sonar. But it also comes with disadvantages. Uh, more specifically, it size scan sonar lacks one de um, the depth information, which means just by looking at the size scan sonar data, we can't really know the three D position of the we can't, we can't really get the 3D geometry of the sea, of the seafloor just by looking at the size scan sonar data. Another thing is that the intensity of size scan sonar depends on multiple factors. So if we look at an example of size scan sonar waterfall image, um, the pixel brightness in this image is the reflected acoustic signal intensity, which is then mapped to uh, zero and one, so black and white. Mm, this pixel brightness depends on um, a lot of factors. So seafloor geometry, the incidence angle of the acoustic waves, the seafloor material, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, this makes com direct comparison of size scan sonar from the same region um, a bit challenging. Um, another thing is that the black region that you see is the water column. So, um, so this is the place where the the signal from the seafloor bottom is actually return, uh, first returned. Um, I mean, this edge here. Uh, the black region in between, that's the water, that's where um, the signal is traveling through the water. So if there's anything in the water, for instance, fish, or um, in our algae farm uh, scenario in Christian Bay, um, the ropes, you would see them in, the, in this water column region. Um, if we have a closer look at a segment of this image, we can see that uh, we can see these stripes, these lines. Um, so these are, for this data set, it's the trolling marks. And what is trolling? Um, trolling is, well, is a type of fishing method uh, where you drag a troll door or troll net across the seafloor bottom. Um, the trolling marks that we just saw can remain in the seafloor for decades. Um, which makes them good candidate for underwater localization. But um, there are also environmental concerns given that they remain the sea for, for decades. Um, so this is a brief introduction. Next, I would go into an application which is local feature correspondence using size scan sonar images. Mm. So to start with the problem statement. Um, so the problem goes like this. Um, we input into the system two size scan sonar seafloor images, such as these ones to the left. The goal is to output an image 
uh, as this one to the right, which is where we connect the pixels between these two images that correspond to the same part of the seafloor. The method that I have used is a modified D2Net, which is a deep learning based method. So why is this problem important? Well, solving the, pro solving the pixel correspondence problem is a step for simultaneous localization and mapping for AUVs. And the reason that I'm using deep learning methods um, is first of all, deep learning has been successful in many computer vision research, more specifically in the same type of problems for, com for camera images. Um, recently, Smart has also been working on sonar image matching using deep learning methods and achieving quite good results. Another thing is that deep learning hasn't quite been applied to size scan sonar image sub-image level correspondence um, in the way that we are applying right now. So we would like to leverage what deep learning has achieved in camera images to size scan sonar images. A look at the local feature correspondence problem. Um, so this problem consists of, is usually phrased as a three-stage pipeline where we input two images, um, and then there's three steps. First is key point detection. Um, the detected key points will be described using, uh, using descriptors. And then finally, these descriptors will be matched using some sort of distance-based metrics. Um, the key point detection stage aims to, find, aims to find points in the image that are salient, meaning that they are distinguishable from they are distinguishable from the from the other regions of the image, and that they are repeatable, meaning that um, these points can be detected under different, uh, even if the image is taken under different conditions, such as um, viewpoints and illumination differences. The detected key points in this step is then described using some sort of 3D tensors. Um, the ideal descriptor should be distinctive, meaning that they wouldn't confuse one descriptor from one region from descriptor of a different region, but they should also be invariant to the conditions under which the image is taken. Um, finally, these detect this, uh, descriptors are fed into a matching, uh, a matching algorithm where the descriptive distance metric is computed and the idea of the matching stage is that we would like to minimize the distance between the descriptors from the same physical region. So um, with this problem, there have been quite an extensive research, both from the handcrafted methods and the deep learning based methods. Um, for the handcrafted methods, um, such as SIFT and root SIFT, they usually closely follow the three-stage pipeline, so detection, description, and matching that I just talked about. Um, they've been very popular in camera and side scan sonar images. For deep learning-based methods that start to come perhaps within the past 10 years, um, many of them do not actually follow the pipeline exactly, but merge multiple stages together. Um, recent research has shown that a lot of these um, data-driven methods outperform the handcrafted methods in size in camera images. But once again, they haven't been applied to size and sonar images. So the data that I have used for this study comes from, uh, uh, wait, data that I have, yeah, here, so here's a bathymetry or seafloor depth plot of the, of the area where, the, where my data comes from. Um, and the thin blue lines that you see is the trajectory, is the AV trajectory. Um, and for this study, I've only used the trajectories that are going, oh, that are going north and south. So given the waterfall, size scan sonar waterfall images from the survey, what we do is that we first divide the image, divide the size scan sonar um, waterfall images into a image patch data set. Uh, exact details are unimportant, <laughs> but um, as for a deep learning pipeline, we need a training set and a test set. And what you can see is that the training set is approximately four times larger than the test set. Um, important to know is also that the training and tests are completely disjoint. 
So next up, I would like to briefly talk about the model architecture. Um, so in this, in this study, what we do is that we feed for every single uh, size scan sonar image patch, we feed it into some, uh, a network called D2Net whose structure is shown here. Um, it's basically exactly the same as the backbone is exactly the same as the VGG16 backbone, which is a popular convolutional neural network used for um, used to extract features. One modification that we did was that the last channel, which is normally 512, uh, the last layer, which is normally 512 channels, was reduced to only 128 channels because the the original the original D2Net was trained on RGB camera images, which tend to be more featureful than our grayscale size scan sonar images. So the last layer, the output of this network, so this last layer, uh, is viewed in two ways for this specific network. If we have a closer look at this final output feature map, um, it is a 128 by 32 by 32 tensor, um, which can be viewed as two ways, one for detection, one for key point detection, and one for key point description. Um, so one way of viewing this is that every single 32 by 32 2D map is seen as a detection map that is used to, this, that is used to tell which point, which pixel position is the most salient. And then every single 128 uh, tensor at every single pixel position can then be used as a feature descriptor to describe the key point that we are to extract. Another important component for a neural network is the loss function. Uh, so that's how we would use, what we would use to train the network. Um, so the network is trained with pairs of images um, with, course, with ground truth correspondence of which pixels in these two images correspond to one another. Um, we can see that there's a description loss and there's a detection loss. Again, exact, de exact uh, mathematical details are unimportant. Uh, we can start to have a look, I'll break this down into the description loss and the detection loss. Um, to start with this, detection uh, description loss part. The description lo loss is something called triplet margin ranking loss. The idea is, idea goes like this. Let's say we have two images, uh, I1 and I2, where point A and point B are correct correspondences. So the idea of this loss function is that we want the descriptor, so the 3D tensor for point A and point B to be as close as possible, while the descriptor should also be as far away as possible from false positives, such as N2 and N1 in this case. Um, the descriptor distance is a Euclidean distance metric. Next up, we have the detection loss part. Um, for this particular network, there's, some, there's a hard detection and a soft detection. Hard detection happens at test time. So that is whether or not this position is, should be selected as a key point. Um, so it's a zero and one binary detection. And a key point at test time is selected um, by first having a look at the, for every single pixel position, we first look at the feature descriptor and then find the channel in this feature descriptor that has the highest value. Let's say, let's call this channel K. And then we look at the detection map, the 2D detection map at this channel. Um, if, the, if this pixel position um, is a local maximum in this detection map, then we would code it as, uh, then we would say that, oh, it is a key point. So for this image, for instance, um, a detection, a hard, a hard detection would look like this where the yellow points are the detected salient key points. At training time, however, uh, a binary detection is not, is a bit, what well, we would like a soft, we would like a softer detection for the, gra for the gradient. So that is why we would have soft detection, which is, um, so for every single pixel, we would calculate 
some sort of channel saliency and uh, uh, and uh, the spatial saliency, and then we merge them together, um, which basically means that the we make the previous binary detection into some sort of heat map. So that would look like approximately like this. So where the um, darker red means that they are more salient. Um, yes, so with these two parts clarified, uh, let's have a final look at the loss function. So um, in general, it means that we are considering all pairs of pixel correspondences that are found um, in the image pairs that we feed in. And we uh, care about the description loss for all of them, but we give high importance to the, descriptor, to the description losses from the pixel pairs that are more salient. So from the pixel pairs that have higher detection scores. Um, yes, with that, let's have a look at the results. Um, so in this study, I've compared um, a traditional method, which is root sift, um, with a trained network. So I've compared them in terms of number of key points detected, repeatability of these key points, and the number of number of matches in uh, using three different matching criteria. As we can see, um, the trivial pairs aren't particularly important. Um, let's have a look at the non-trivial pairs. So in this case, we can see that the network is capable of finding more key points uh, with high with high repeatability, and finding more number of matches in one of the criteria. Was um, was the traditional method seem seemed to be able to find more matches using the other criteria? Um, however, it's important to note that finding number of matches isn't the same as finding correct number, finding correct matches. So the matching accuracy is shown in these plots where the red lines are, where the solid red lines is, uh, is for the network's accuracy on the non-trivial data set. And the, the blue lines are the accuracy from the roots of the traditional method. What we can see is that um, as the pixel threshold increases, so um, the less strict we are with what we mean by correct matches, um, the better the network is performing. And we can see that network actually reaches higher accuracy than the traditional method um, after a after approximately um, eight or nine pixel threshold. So finally, I would like to have a look at the detection and matching results. So um, here's an example of a test image. Um, the detection results from root set is shown here. We can see that they actually very well aligned with uh, where we human would probably see as, oh, these are good key points to detect. Mm, so they are rather aligned on the on the trolling marks. When it comes to the network's detections, we can see that they're much more grid-like. And as a human, it might be difficult to tell why it is detecting these positions. Um, one thing I would like to mention about the grid-like um, property of this detection is because it is uh, the detection happens at the final, the final layer, so the 32 by 32 um, feature map, so which is which is like this, whilst the original image is eight times larger, which is why uh, the detections look much more grid-like. So one way to mitigate this would be to do some sort of in linear interpolation, um, but that isn't done on this study. And then uh, I would like to show you some matching results. Uh, first, let's have a look at the similar view viewpoints. So these are two images. These are two side scan sonar patches uh, with the ground truth correspondence uh, that are rather linear, that are rather parallel to one another. Um, we can see that again, once again, roots of the traditional methods detections, they are very well, they are positioned uh, rather accurately on the trolling marks. However, the matching results uh, not ideal. They're basically randomly matching uh, the key points detected to one another. Whereas on the other hand, if we look at the network's performance, 
um, once again, we can see that they are much more grid-like, but the um, but the matching accuracy, so the green ones, the green lines means that they're correctly matched and the red ones means that they're incorrectly matched. Um, so the matching accuracy is much higher in this case for the network. But this is the ideal case with similar viewpoints. So that's, for instance, when, a, when the AUV is uh, inspecting one area by traveling in the same direction. But if the AUV is traveling into the, in, uh, across the same area in different directions, let's say um, exactly opposite directions, that would give us something, the ground truth would look something like this. So this is an example of where the AV has different viewpoints. Um, so the ground truth correspondence would look a bit like an X shape. In this case, if we look at the root surf detections, um, once again, very well localized key points, but matching accuracies, not quite. Um, as for the network, it's also grid light detections, but one, but what we can see is that the network seems to prefer matching points, matching key points um, parallel in parallel, which could indicate something about the data, which could indicate that there are if there are many, there are probably many more cases in the data where we have parallel matches which is probably what is resulting in the network preferring to match, um, to match key points in a parallel fashion. So to conclude this part of the study, um, what I've shown is that neural network architectures designed for camera image correspondences, they can be fine-tuned and transferred to side-scan sonar seafloor images, and that data-driven methods can outperform handcrafted methods. Um, there are, of course, quite a bit of limitations for the work. Um, for instance, the key point localization accuracy for the network, as we've shown before, um, could be improved. The matching accuracy with significant viewpoint changes um, also needs improvement. And then finally, the size and quality of the data set um, requires some improvement as well. If we compare our data set to, to normal, to normal data set that is used for camera camera image correspondence, they are much, much, much larger than our data set. Um, so future work is uh, future work is approximately what I would be researching on for my for um, the next few months of my PhD. So first is uh, concerns data set improvement. So we do have more data on the same area. Um, I work on using using them to train the network. Um, high resolution size scan sonar images. We do have them as well. Um, and then we also need better ground truth, more accurate ground truth correspondences. Um, and we need a standardized size scan sonar image pre-processing pipeline um, that would allow us to better compare the work that we do in the future. Another line of future work is that we could change the network design. Um, for instance, we could change, we could, instead of using D2Net, we could use different, back, different backbone architectures. We could also try something like multitask learning or graph convolution networks, transformers. Um, so there are many research directions from there. Um, that concludes my part on local feature correspondence using SciScan Sonar. And finally, I just want to briefly, very briefly touch upon the Christina Bay demo. Um, so here's a algae farm simulation in Stonefish. Um, not entirely sure if it's 100% to scale, um, but approximately we have two lines of algae. And the idea is that how SciScan Sonar will be used in this, in this demo is that we would like to use size scan sonar data from the rope to help the AOV to uh, localize. So uh, a so this is a real size scan sonar data. So this is uh, actually the rope in the in size scan sonar data in the water. So that is in the water column region. And based on where this based on where this uh, 
rope signal is shown in the size scan sonar data, um, we could actually ca we could calculate um, how far away we are from the rope, and using that information, helping the AV to navigate. Um, but that's also ongoing work. Yes, um, that kind of concludes my talk. Thank you, Lee. Uh, there are there